Hey everybody, Rob Maurer here. Happy Friday. Today we have some news on Tesla out of China. We have a couple of product updates beyond what we have heard about with sort of the quote unquote 2021 model year refresh. We have some news on Tesla in Indonesia and a couple other things as well. We'll take a quick check on the stock since we haven't for a while. Tesla on the day to day finished down 1.2% to $420.63, six cents shy of the finish I'm sure everybody was hoping for, but the NASDAQ on the day finished up 0.4%, so Tesla lagging behind a little bit there. And for the week, obviously this was earnings week, a lot of expectations heading into it. Tesla for the week now has finished down just a little bit less than 5%. I think you've all heard my thoughts on earnings. I was extremely happy with those. We've also seen the full self-driving beta start to roll out. And initially the results from that seem incredibly strong ahead of what I was expecting. So to see the stock down, certainly not how I think the stock should be reacting to this news. Again, I'm very bullish on Tesla. Tesla is ahead of my expectations. So I definitely think right now Wall Street is completely missing the impact that what happened this week is going to have in the future. I've joked around a little bit about that on Twitter this week, and some people have responded to that saying, oh, it's not surprising, like, isn't all this stuff already priced in? The market already expects these things from Tesla. I don't think anybody expected a 23.7% automotive gross margin excluding regulatory credits from Tesla, other than maybe a couple of the most bullish people on Twitter. To me, that stuff is not priced in. The stock reacted the way it did, in my opinion, because of some of the things that drove down Tesla's earnings per share, and actually cause them to be below expectations on that final gap EPS line. It's a lot easier to look at that and shrug and say, Meh, Tesla missed it by a few cents per share, no big deal, without taking the time to fully understand the context of that result and how the outsized impact from Elon's compensation plan, particularly in this quarter, suppressed both Tesla's operating income, which was already incredibly strong, and their gap earnings per share. I think as investors and analysts start taking a closer look, updating their models, I think they're going to realize how strong these results were and how impactful they're going to be for the future outlook. As for the FSD stuff, I mean, we've talked a lot about how Tesla can justify and exceed its current valuation just on its automotive business alone, not even factoring energy, solar, autonomy. So to me, that's not priced in other than the additional margin that Tesla is able to generate off their software sales currently. That's a big part of the valuation for sure. But an autonomous robo taxi network is not yet, in my opinion. Maybe this rewrite starts to slowly diminish the discount rate that people are applying on that or the risk that that will never happen. And that starts to factor in a little bit more to the valuation. Maybe we see it start to be included in a few more analyst notes. I think it'll be sort of this slow awakening of people starting to acknowledge more of the value from that potential business line. But I don't really expect that understanding or that recognition to come as quickly as the recognition of just how strong this quarter was for Tesla financially. So those are kind of my thoughts on Tesla for the week. As for the day, Tesla seemed to be down today because of the news that there is a Model S and Model X recall in China for those vehicles produced from 2013 to 2017. Now this is a little bit odd because it's specific to China, but obviously Tesla was manufacturing those vehicles in the United States. So I think when the report came out, there was potentially some fear that, okay, if this recall is happening in China, maybe this happens in the United States. And as with all of this reporting, at least initially, it's not always clear what's going on with the recall, how severe or serious it is. Maybe that extends to other product lines and maybe this recall grows in size to the point where it could be potentially impactful. And those concerns can obviously weigh on the stock. So this morning, Bloomberg and others reported that Tesla was recalling 30,000 of these vehicles from China for suspension issues. And that was sort of the extent of the reporting. Later in the day today, we got a little bit more information from Electrek, which says that they obtained a letter from Tesla's managing counsel for regulatory affairs, which Tesla had sent to NHTSA to tell them about this China recall. And in that note, they write, quote, due to the opinion of SAMR slash DPAC that the topic required a recall in the China market, Tesla was left with the choice of either voluntarily recalling the subject vehicles or carrying a heavy burden through the Chinese administrative process. While Tesla disagrees with the, S the opinion of SAMR slash DPAC, the company has decided not to dispute a recall for the China market only, end quote. Later on, Tesla says that they believe that, quote, the root cause of the issue is driver abuse, including that driver usage and expectation for damageability is uniquely severe in the China market, end quote. So essentially, Tesla feels like they shouldn't have to do the recall. They're going to do it anyway to avoid the administrative headache. And they said that this issue with the suspension has happened in less than 0.05% of vehicles outside of China and about 0.1% of vehicles in China. 
out of the 30,000 SNX in China reportedly recalled for this, 0.1% is 30 vehicles. So it's not nothing, but even 30,000 vehicles, Tesla has more than a million on the road. Recalls are going to happen. They've happened for Tesla in the past. They happen for all other automakers. It's part of the business, but nothing that I'm seeing here that is concerning me. Next up, I do want to stick with China, but catch up on some news from earlier this week. A number of different news sources have reported that Tesla is planning to begin exporting this month the Model 3 from Giga Shanghai to more than 10 countries in Europe. <laughs> so Europe continues to be this sort of battleground, I think, between bulls and bears, because obviously the bearish take on this is going to be, okay, well, there's no demand in China, or not enough demand, so Tesla has no choice but to export. The bull take on this is that Tesla just has not been able to get enough vehicles over to Europe because of the production shutdowns originally in Fremont and Q2, potentially building up a backlog of demand in Europe, and then what seems to be pretty strong demand in North America, really just not leaving enough vehicles for Europe. If that's the case, and from what Elon Musk said on the conference call, it does sound like that is the case, Tesla needs to get them some cars at some point in time from somewhere. They can't just completely abandon their customers in those markets. That would obviously be bad for future business. So Tesla has to balance their supply chain right now, which is only producing on two continents to deliver vehicles to pretty much the whole world. So until Tesla has more localized production, they're going to be assessing all their options, weighing the benefits and the costs of shipping from China or shipping from the US. It's just not nearly as simple as China demand bad ship outside China. For example, the cost to produce a Model 3 in China is probably cheaper. The logistical cost of shipping those to Europe may be a little bit less. And Tesla has more room to expand with Gigafactory Shanghai. It's just a newer facility than what they have in Fremont. So if Shanghai can reduce the burden on Fremont for Model 3, Tesla can either stop pushing to grow that or maybe even decline that output, possibly in favor of shifting over some of those production resources for Model Y. That could even be as simple as the batteries because we know that for Fremont, Tesla's gonna use the 2170s from Giga Nevada. We know that in China, they're bringing on CATL for more of the lithium iron phosphate, lower cost batteries. So if Tesla can deliver those and utilize that battery supply chain for Model 3 going to Europe, that may reduce the production requirements on Model 3 from Fremont, opening up some additional battery capacity potentially for greater production of Model Y. So if we start to dig into some of this nuance here, you can see that Tesla has this really tricky equation that they're constantly trying to balance as best they can to optimize all of these different variables, customer wait time, cost, production right now, and in the coming future. Even things like tariffs or tax rates or foreign exchange could come into play. So my point isn't to persuade people one way or the other here on the exact situation. My point is just to bring to surface a lot of the elements here that need to be considered. These decisions are not made, in my opinion, simply as a function of demand. All right, moving on from that topic, we do have some updates from Green the Only on Twitter, who occasionally finds some things that are interesting in Tesla firmware. And in a series of tweets, he talked about sort of the Model 3 refresh stuff that we know about. Interestingly, though, he did hear confirm the heated steering wheel that I think Electric had reported on, but I hadn't really seen that in other places. So that gives me more confidence that that is something that's going to be a part of the refresh here with the Model 3. But then on the Model Y, he's saying he's seeing some interesting things. Quote, Model Y gets third row flat fold. It also gets HEPA filter and corresponding biohazard mode. This apparently is not planned for Model 3 at this time. Standard slash adaptive air suspension made reappearance on 3 slash Y. So it's also certainly in the works, end quote. Green goes on to also talk about some new sensor appearances, specifically saying there are new sensor types for both the ultrasonics and for the radar, which appears like it will be supplied by a third party going forward. Again, this is all a little bit speculative, but Green says that the vendor appears to be ARB Robotics. So before anybody gets in a tizzy about updated sensors, just because Tesla is updating and improving on their sensor suite potentially here, that doesn't necessarily mean that the old sensor suite isn't going to be able to accomplish what Tesla wants to accomplish with it. If Tesla has a way to make things better or make them cheaper, Tesla's going to take those opportunities. Sort of the same situation that we're going to see unfold with Tesla's eventual hardware 4 full self-driving chip, which will in many ways be better than the hardware 3 chip. But we also have to consider that Tesla does have a lot of incentive to make sure that their current fleet can eventually become fully autonomous robo-taxis because if they can, that's going to generate a lot of money for Tesla. So to some extent, customer and Tesla incentives are aligned in that regard. 
Obviously doesn't mean it'll happen for sure, but worth remembering in the context of hardware updates. And again, at this point, this is all pretty speculative, so we'll just have to wait and see when we start seeing some of these newer vehicles out in the wild, what sort of equipment they have. And even from these tweets, it's not clear to me if this is something that's in the works right now or it's just appearing in the firmware and may eventually be something that is delivered. Remember, in the firmware, Green has also spotted references to 100 kilowatt hour Model 3s, but we haven't seen that happen, and Elon has pretty consistently, up until battery day, said that it won't be happening, though obviously with the potential 54% range increase from battery day, we could eventually see a larger pack in a Model 3 someday. All right, last couple of quick things here today. We had previously talked about Tesla discussing with the Indonesian government about a possible factory in Indonesia, which is the largest producer of nickel, which we know Tesla is oh so fond of. Well, on Monday, CNBC Indonesia reported that Tesla continues to have ongoing discussions with the government, and they have actually been directed by the government towards a specific location in Indonesia for a potential factory. So these discussions and plans continue to seem to be progressing. And while I wouldn't expect a gigafactory or vehicle production in Indonesia, I think it'll be not too long from now when we're talking about Tesla starting construction on some sort of nickel related project in Indonesia. Last thing today, kind of a fun way to wrap up the week here. Tesla has received a lot of questions over the years about why there are not more solar panels on top of the roof at Giga Nevada. Well, they have now begun to expand that solar panel coverage. Tesla owner Silicon Valley on Twitter sharing some updated photos of the Gigafactory last week. And while before there was a really small portion of the Gigafactory that had those solar panels on it, it looks like the coverage has now been extended to maybe, I don't know, 20% of the roof or so, which I don't know. Even though Tesla has installed multiple gigawatts of solar, there's just something about seeing it right there at the source that is just pretty inspiring. So it makes me happy to see that, and hopefully someday most of that roof will be entirely covered with solar. All right, that will wrap it up for today then and for the week. As always, thank you for listening. Don't forget to subscribe and sign up for notifications. Make sure you're following me on Twitter at Tesla Podcast, and I'll see you on Monday for the October 26th episode of Tesla Daily. Thank you.